Oh man, now I'm really growing some hair in my balls. I'm looking at Dark Souls, the new measuring stick apparently when judging a game's difficulty nowadays. And this is something I didn't know until now, but uh, I already looked at this game two times. Yeah, I always thought I was looking at Crash Bandicoot and Cuphead when I looked at those games, but according to some folks, these games are part of the Dark Souls cinematic universe. So I guess it'd be inaccurate to say this is my first Dark Souls. I'm kidding, of course, yeah, this is a first time for me. I think everyone has heard of the Dark Souls series in some form or fashion, but you know, I had no uh, real personal interest in it until a couple of years back when my good friend Resh donated to me uh, the PC version of the game. I also got the PS3 version as a Christmas gift from my brother Mark a few years ago, and it's been sitting on my shelf ever since. Hey, I'm not feeling too bad. I recommend that man games all the time, but he always falls back to Elder Scrolls or Call of Duty. I love you, Mark, if you happen to be watching. Anyway, I was sort of surprised to learn that Dark Souls was a Japanese developed title. In 2011, the year the game was initially released, we had games like Dragon Age and Elder Scrolls, distinctly Western RPGs. They had a certain look to them, you know? I haven't played Dark Souls up until this point, but I've seen it in action a couple of times throughout the years, and based on its looks and supposed setting in medieval times, I thought it was of a similar vein. But nope, this game was published by Namco Bandai and was developed by From Software, led by Hidetaka Miyazaki. And I always find it at least interesting to see how Eastern cultures take a stab at creating something that's, you know, usually catered for the West question audiences. But for Mr. Miyazaki, I suppose this wasn't his first swing at it. Everyone talks about Dark Souls, but technically the series started with the 2009 Demon Souls. I didn't hear much about this one, despite it being highly praised and such by media outlets, so I guess either a lot of people didn't buy this, or Dark Souls is just that much better. Well, whether you play Demon Souls or not, it doesn't matter. Dark Souls is more of a spiritual successor to Demon Souls, so they're not directly tied together. The most you'll miss out is maybe a reference or two here and there. I don't know. I never played Demon Souls, and I don't plan on to for some time. So as this is the Donators Marathon, the end of the Donators Marathon at that, I'm going to be looking at the PC version that my friend Resh donated to me. Two things before we start, though. Some people have told me I should have waited until the remastered version to look at the game, to which I say, yeah, maybe. But I don't think there'd be any substantial differences between the game that's been out for some time compared to the slightly prettier version of it. To me, this isn't going from Crash on the PS1 to the insane trilogy nowadays, you know? Secondly, several of you have recommended that I download a mod for the PC version called DS Fix, because apparently the PC version of the game wasn't optimized properly and doesn't have the option for higher resolutions and 60 frames per second gameplay. And that's good and all, thank you for the recommendation, but I didn't bother. Firstly, I read that the poor optimization issue was only a thing if you didn't have a high-end PC to run the game, which isn't the case for me personally, and secondly, I feel that using a mod to enhance my experience because the base game lacked something is sort of cheating. I want to review what's being sold to me as is, not after installing a mod, no matter how trivial or cosmetic it might seem. And on that note, just to say this now, I didn't have any performance issues in the slightest, and I thought the game looked just fine. I mean, there was that one time I fell through the fucking floor, and I got a laugh out of that, but that was the only time something that game-breaking occurred. Still, if optimization and performance is your sticking point, either play the remastered edition, or use the PC mod if it means that much to you. Alright then, let's get to it. I'm popping my Dark Souls cherry at last, but before we do anything else, we gotta start with that plot summary. Well, okay, I would start with the plot summary, but to my utter shock, there's barely what I identify as a standard story in this game. Like, when the game starts off, we're given a bit of how this world came to be, with total a few characters and nothing much else, but then we're immediately thrown into the thick of it. After spending some time creating my character, we're told to ring these two bells hidden within the land of Lordran, collect the Lord Souls, and return them to the fire located in the Firelink Altar. Best of luck, and that's fucking it. Dark Souls is minimalistic to a T. There's not much of an ongoing story here. It's light on plot threads. There's rarely any cousins to progress story. There's only a handful of NPCs you can chat with to get more context of your surroundings. That's assuming you've even run into them at all. You never really railroad it into doing anything in this game for anyone else. It's just you, your weapons, and the next challenge ahead. In Dark Souls, it's up to you to form your own narrative, and the only way you're getting more out of it is the use of observation and imagination to deduce why things are the way they are. Now, I have no problem with this sort of design. After all, Metroid Prime did something sort of similar where most of the story on were behind optional scan logs if I had to compare it to something else I knew. But Dark Souls is much longer than an average Metroid Prime game. I clocked in close to 60 hours when I was finished, which was actually more about 55 hours because I left the game running a couple of times while I attempted things, but god damn, a game that long with next to no story, an action RPG at that? God almighty. Jumping the gun here, I did grow a little fatigued around the 30 hour mark because without a growing story to keep me occupied, it was easier for me to realize how repetitious the game was slowly becoming. I get to a new location, here's the new minions, here's the big 
big boss, onto the next area. A very old school structure. I mean, that was the deal with a lot of games back in the day. But something like that with this scope, that's a whole other story. This might be a deal breaker if a strong constant narrative is what you're looking for in an action RPG or otherwise, because I have to stress again, for the majority of this game, it is just you all by your lonesome trying to survive whatever you happen to stumble upon next. You have no friends constantly by your side, no reoccurring henchmen now that I think about it. You don't even have a map to know where you're going. You gotta remember these locales by heart. You know what you must do, you go ahead and do it, but how you do it is entirely up to you. It's kind of like the first Legend of Zelda the more I look back, or Breath of the Wild if you want to be more contemporary. Yeah, you know what? It's the Legend of Zelda uh, that keeps kicking you in the dick repeatedly. My adventure began in this dank prison that looked like shit, everyone else around me looked like shit, but fortune turned to my favor when my knight in shining armor from above like a divine angel gave me the key to my cell and I was able to escape. And then that knight ends up dying. Oh well, fuck, I didn't even get his name. So here I am trying to figure my way out and fuck me already, a giant demon. All right, all right, gotta play cool, play cool. It's probably not that fast, but ow, fuck, he hurts. And just like that, I died. This is gonna be a long playthrough. So after exploring a bit, I find myself better suited to the play style, but man, that took a bit to adjust to. There is a lot of weight to your character's movements from how you walk, how you run, the way you can dodge roll. It's almost 3D Legend of Zelda on molasses. You gotta carefully plan on how you attack or dodge things in this game because nothing is instantaneous. Things require wind up. And if you fuck up, you're left wide open to counterattack. And oh yeah, you will get counterattacked constantly. <laughs> And if you're thinking you can spam attacks or dodges repeatedly, uh-uh. Almost everything requires stamina, that little green bar under your health, and early on, it drains fast. This was my first hurdle, just getting used to this control scheme. I used an Xbox 360 controller for this, and it's not every day where I play a game like this where the shoulder buttons are used for light and heavy attacks. The face buttons are used for item consumption, scrolling through text, dodge rolling, sprinting, jumping, and I gotta say, I really don't like how jumping works in this game. You can't jump from a standstill, you have to be sprinting to get a running start, and then you have to press the sprint button again to make the leap. I got used to it, but there was always a degree of clumsiness to it, making any time I had to perform a daring jump across an obstacle mentally taxing. Like right here, I gotta jump over this broken bridge to get to the other side while this asshole's throwing firebombs at me. All right, here I go. Oh, fuck. Oh, <laughs> I gotta do that all over again. But back to my predicament. I explore the prison, I get better suited, I guess, and I take on the demon once more. I might as well be using a broken bottle for a weapon with how much range I had, but I managed to lay the killing blow. Victory achieved, yeah, and I was given a shitload of souls. This is your currency of the game. They let you purchase equipment and items from merchants, upgrade your weapons and armor, the basic shit. But souls are also experience points. Assuming you don't want to buy anything for the time, you can invest your souls into certain stats like strength, endurance, dexterity, intelligence, because God knows I need that shit. You can make your character more proficient in certain areas by investing souls into a particular stat, but the more your stats increase, the more expensive it gets to add to it later. So from the moment your journey begins, you need to consider what type of fighter you're going to be. Someone with a lot of strength, a lot of speed, a dedicated magic user, someone go with range attacks. Make sure you know, because if you spend too much on one kind of stat, you won't be able to increase other stats without doing a shitload of grinding. Well, you may need to grind anyway, because... <laughs> I went with a dedicated strength build because I believe the best strategy is not so much practicing grace and nimbleness, but hitting my opponent really fucking hard. But later on, I came across some magic spells I'd like to get some use out of, but because I spent so much on building my strength, endurance, and dexterity, it took a bit to get my intelligence level up to snuff to even consider equipping it. But don't let that discourage you from choosing a certain build, because if there's one thing I will compliment Dark Souls considerably in, it clearly caters to multiple playstyles. No matter the encounter, big or small, there are strategies for melee fighters, magic users, you name it. You gotta find that strategy, of course, and you will die a shitload of times just learning the ins and outs, but depending on your approach and stat building, that could lead to a totally different experience, and that's always good for replayability in case you enjoy what you experienced the first time. So I killed the demon, I head up a little further, and then I get kidnapped by a giant bird and get taken to the Firelink Shrine. What ends up being the central hub for this adventure? I'm told about the giant bells I have to ring and all that, and from this point on, it's just a matter of how I go about things. So let's see, I decided to go left because, well, I have no idea what I'm doing, so fuck it. I came across this graveyard where these skeleton warriors took shape, and now we're getting Jason and the Argonauts up in here. They were kicking my ass just from damage alone, but despite this, I found it a good opportunity to learn how defensive maneuvers worked, assuming they don't break through my shield in one attack. Eventually, though, I realized I was getting nowhere really fucking quickly and decided to just make a beeline to the next area, where I'm sure a conga line of skeletons were right on my tail and that death was sure to follow if I ever decided to stop. I discovered the catacombs, couldn't see shit, then suddenly something explodes in my face and I eat dirt once more. 
turns out after some research, the catacombs was a late game area I should be visiting way later down the road, but that's how Dark Souls works. Bearing a couple of locked doors here and there, there's nothing technically stopping you from entering a high level area as soon as you want. And hey, if you're brave enough, you can dash through a lot of shit and maybe find some useful items and equipment along the way that are pretty strong for your current situation. You're probably gonna die immediately afterwards, but you don't lose items and equipment when you bite it, just souls. And odds are you don't have much of those this early in the game. It sucks when you die when you do have a lot of souls though. If you can get back to the spot where you died previously, you can retrieve the souls you lost and press on, but if you die again before reaching that spot, those souls are permanently gone and it is the fucking worst. But okay, the graveyard and the catacombs beyond the graveyard was obviously too much for me at this point. I decided to go right this time, and soon I entered the undead parish. This was infinitely more manageable for me, but I still couldn't rest easy. Because I decided to focus on strength and melee weapons, I had to get up close and personal to basically everyone and everything. And as such, I had to learn to be patient, realize this isn't Kingdom Hearts, and learn how to take these assholes down methodically. And it was getting me results, but I was fucked if enemies decided to swarm me or if I was slowly being picked off by some prick archer in the distance. I never thought I'd be so relieved to see bonfires. I don't go camping often, but these are lifesavers in this game. They're checkpoints that restore your health, your stamina, and refill your Estus flasks, essentially potions that you can guzzle at any time to refill some health because you're sure as shit gonna be taking damage throughout. However, when you use a bonfire, every enemy in the area will respawn with a couple of exceptions. While this means you have to deal with them again if they happen to be in your way, this also means you could potentially grind those enemies if they happen to be close to the bonfire, you grab their souls, rest at the bonfire, then level up your stats and do it again and again until you think you're ready. I was curious about this reverse hollowing option and what it meant. Throughout the game, you can score something called humanity. By itself, it could be used to restore health, but if you use it to kindle your bonfire, you can get more Estus Flash to help you survive in your journey. So I thought that was great. It's good to know that later down the road, I can carry around 20 of these things and not affect my equipment load in the slightest. I'm an alcoholic for Estus Flash, don't judge me. The main reason you want humanity though, is to reverse your hollow state. You see, you're kind of dead, but with humanity, you can restore your humanity, where you can rock flesh and blood once more and no longer look like a sentient beef jerky. But be forewarned, you lose your humanity if you die, so it's best to hold on to it as long as you can. As a human, you can get a few benefits. If you have enough humanity stocked away in this counter on the top left of the screen here, you have a better chance of getting items from falling enemies. You can also gain the ability to summon phantoms whenever you see these markings on the floor, warriors from another realm that can temporarily help you take out foes. They could be controlled by the AI, or be another player from a different server. Now, this is a really cool thing about Dark Souls. Occasionally, you may see what looks to be an apparition of another warrior. These are, in fact, other players currently playing the game. You can't interact with them, but maybe if you examine these bloodstains on the ground, you might get an idea of some lurking danger up ahead thanks to someone else's fuck up. Other players can also leave messages on the ground warning you of something ahead, or they can help you discover a hidden treasure. I thought this was a fantastic idea. It's like Miiverse before uh, Miiverse died. Under the right circumstances, Dark Souls has a great sense of community regarding you and other like-minded players, almost like an MMO, only you can't really physically interact with anyone. There were a couple of assholes scattered about, folks telling me to jump off when there's clearly nothing below, or telling me to attack someone that looks like a bad guy but is actually a friendly? Yeah, thanks dicks. Phantoms, however, can be an absolute game changer in some of the fiercest battles. They can dish out their own powerful attacks if they're properly equipped, or they can serve as an excellent distraction so that the current boss doesn't notice you slowly hacking away at their ankles. It is in your best interest to keep your human state active always, which is what I would be saying if it weren't for the biggest trade-off of this mechanic. Just as you're able to summon phantoms to help you on your journey, by being human, you're also leaving yourself open to invasion. What's an invasion? Basically some assholes deciding, hmm, how am I gonna fuck up someone's day? These are players from another server or such that invade your world with the sole purpose of killing you and taking away your humanity. I hate this shit because most of the time I'm up against someone who is clearly above my level. They get me in stun locks because they probably put 2,000 hours into this game and know the inner machinations of every single fucking pixel and detail and it's just a fucking roadblock. The only way to avoid invasions is to stay in a hollow state. I hear that if you play without an internet connection, you can't get invaded that way as well, but I didn't really try that. And don't get me wrong, the game is perfectly playable and beatable when hollowed, but it sucks that I can't reap the rewards of humanity without being a paranoid fuckstick, wondering if I'm going to be invaded in the upcoming area. I think it's already challenging enough to hold on to humanity, given the game's natural challenge with all the threats you face in different locations. This is something not totally in my control, and I don't generally like that sort of thing. Look at this, like, what, what is this dickhead doing? You gonna attack me? You gonna do something up. Would you stop fucking doing that? I can't feel this shit, you know. Jesus, go. Would you fuck off? Well, I hope he certainly learned his lesson. Oh, Christ's sake. Go away! No, oh, God damn it! Ugh. With the proper item, you can invade other worlds yourself, assuming you actually find one active. This game is a little old at this point, and there's two other sequels they're probably playing instead. So I'm not too surprised, and frankly, I'd rather just get to move on. Over in the undead parish is where my luck started to shine. I was committed to the strength build, I was determined to learn the best way to deal with enemies using melee attacks, I was slowly getting better at the game. And then I ran into the Black Knight and I got fucking cleaved. Uh. 
But I didn't let this stop me. I bought a handful of firebombs from this merchant close by and led the Black Knight to this upper part of town. I climbed this ladder and started pelting him with those firebombs, and it was working. I'm guessing Black Knights can't jump or climb ladders, but soon he went down, and to my joy, I got his weapon as a drop, the Black Knight Sword, which had amazing stats this early in the game, but not only could I eventually reinforce it with materials to make it stronger, it also scaled with my current stats whenever I leveled up, making it even better. And just like that, I got what I considered to be one of my favorite weapons in the entire game. I'm not kidding. This ended up being my weapon of choice for nearly my whole duration of playing this game. It had a bit of weight to it, but it fucking carved and split enemies in just two strikes most of the time. Even the bigger goons went down with a well-placed jump slash. As long as I could avoid attacks and knew when to strike, the small fry were just that small fry. Even some bosses didn't last too long with my eventual setup, although they can still kill me very quickly if I so much breathe on them. Now this didn't stop me from trying out other weapons, I mean before I was able to use the sword, I got some good mileage from the battle axe. Against the Taurus demon, I loved being able to climb this ladder and bash the fuck out of him with a plunge to his skull. Sometimes you can also temporarily add elemental properties to your weapons with special items, or you can just find some weapons with elemental properties already installed. I got some good use out of the lightning spear, it was a good way to keep my distance from these bloated tumors that exploded in toxic shit when they died, and trust me, you don't want to get the toxic status, it's like poison on crack. For a time, I also tried out some great swords. They took a lot out of me to even swing them, but they packed the punch, and I even got this Drake sword by hitting this dragon's tail enough times with arrows. I didn't even try to fight this thing head on. I still haven't killed it even after finishing the game, but the Drake sword was a good alternative until I was strong enough to wield my Black Knight weapon. As far as armor went, I went with whatever gave me the best defense. I was pretty vulnerable early on, but once I got the chainmail, things started getting a little better for me. The problem was that some of these pieces were remarkably heavy, and if you're close to reaching your equipment load, you slow down tremendously, adding even more weight to your movements and wreaking havoc on your stamina. But later on, I found a solution to this. I went to the bottom of this watchtower and encountered this lone guy just waiting there, I guess. It's funny too, I'm heading down there and I see this guy suddenly running towards me. I'm like, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck. And this dude hits like a motherfucker, like one shot and I'm on the floor. But when I did manage to kill him, I got his accessory, Havel's Ring. With this, I was able to equip super heavy armor without too much movement loss, and with that, I was becoming a living, breathing tank. And to further add to that, I was able to get this dude's armor later on. I look fucking ridiculous, but I can now take much more punishment than previously. With an upgraded shield on my left side and a great weapon on my right side, I felt better equipped for whatever boss fights the game was ready to throw at me. Or whatever ones I fell into. Seriously, fuck the stray demon. I was just trying to explore the prison on the second visit, and I fall down a loose floor like a goddamn Home Alone trap. The bosses are without question the highlight of the game. Most of them are large and in charge and aggressive as fuck. And though some may simply be color swaps of previous bosses with beefed up stats, and some I feel that aren't very interesting design wise, I personally didn't enjoy the battle with Gravelord Nido because of how much of a clusterfuck it felt like. However, there are way more unique battles to be had, including a lady who can turn invisible and sneak up from behind you, a handicapped battle pinning you against this chunky chunk fuck and his partner who gets stronger when his partner dies, there's a giant wolf that, that has a sword in his mouth, I mean, what the fuck is this? Oh man, this thing here, the bed of chaos, my ass was puckered the whole way through. It could sweep you off the floor with its giant Groot fingers, the floor itself could fall apart and I could plummet to my death, but I thought it was so fucking satisfying killing the damn thing. I'm cutting through its branches, there's a little fucker right there, fuck you! <sighs> There's no rhyme or reason why you fight most of these guys, they're just in the way most of the time. But hey, the battles they deliver are a damn good challenge, and the main reason I kept trucking along. There are also some of the only times we get actual music playing. Yeah, unless you're hanging around the Firelink Shrine, it's dead silence everywhere else. You can relish in the ambient noises, but don't expect any musical pieces. In a way, it does make the boss battles feel that more awesome, simply because something is playing in the background. But I think it wouldn't hurt to have some more music playing throughout the game. I don't know, maybe some uh, ambient piano pieces like what Breath of the Wild did. But with no story to really relish in, I spent more time just trying to bask in my environments and getting substance that way, and Dark Souls did give me plenty to look at. Yeah, there's a sewer area, yeah, there's snowy mountains, it's got the standard areas checked off of the list, and this game is grim dark as shit. Like, it's bleak, it's depressing, and almost everyone you can meet is either pessimistic, eerily eccentric, or just straight up douchebags. Eat shit, Frank! There's a few bright spots. Soler of Astora is a total bro. He worships the sun, yearns to find his own, he's pretty jovial and friendly, all things considered, and he makes for an amazing companion on the rare occasion you can summon him while you're human. I also rather enjoyed Onion Man here, uh, Sigmire I think was his name. He's a bit buffoonish, but he means well and will give you items if you help him out whenever he needs 
needs it. If you don't play your cards right though, you can end up killing these guys, and fuck man, that's just mean. I'm heading into this new area we're late into the game and Solaire suddenly brainwashed with no way to save him, and Onion Man wants to help me get past all these Cthulhu-like creatures by acting as a distraction, and he fucking jumps into the pit like he goes through it, but I couldn't get to him on time to save him from the onslaught. Like what the hell man, you give me the only two characters that I like and take them away from me. Fuck this game, I hate it. As my adventure continued, there were several areas that really struck a chord with me. New Londo Ruins was damn chilling, and not so much because of the ghost you encounter later, but because of the revenants. Now in every other area, these guys are attacking you with swords, torches, you name it, but here they're completely docile, some even looking to be praying or suffering from some sort of torment. It's interesting, makes me wonder if this place holds any meaning to these guys. Anor Londo was another highlight for me. Firstly, compared to the other areas before this, it was nice to actually see the fucking sun again, but I love the architecture here, which made for some intense sequences when traveling through the rafters and the rooftops. Oh, well, there was a couple of areas I couldn't stand. Let's not pretend every area was a joy to behold. And if you're expecting me to mention Blight Town, well, yeah, I had some trouble here, but more on the swamp area below. Being constantly poisoned wasn't good for my health, surprisingly, and it was kind of hard to see things. Most folks seem to hate Blight Town because its grim atmosphere makes it confusing the navigate. I can kind of see what they mean, but honestly, I didn't find any area of Dark Souls confusing. You may not have a map feature, but areas are rather linear and hard to get lost in. It also doesn't have much in puzzle solving. It rather just hides stuff from you via secret walls or hidden holes in the floor. Nothing brain taxing about that. You just got to find it. The Tomb of the Giants is where I started getting frustrated a bit. It's dark as hell and to even see where I was going, I had to frequently switch out my shield for this lantern I found, leaving me defenseless whenever I had it out. And that's when beast skeletons usually entered my view and massacred me. Also, this is where I clipped through the floor just to mention that part again. Actually, now that I think about it, everything past the Norlanda was kind of a pain in the ass. Not so much of the areas itself, but because this is where they started starving me for bonfires. Before then, a bonfire wasn't too far off from an upcoming boss fight. Even Blighttown had one before Spider Lady here. So as long as I can avoid the boulder demons with proper sprinting and dodging, it never took me too long to get back to her in case I died to her. But areas like the Crystal Cave, fuck, if you died against this damn dragon, who admittedly wasn't very hard, but still, if you died, you had to travel through the area outside the cave again, avoiding crystal golems, then you had to travel through the caves themselves and it's full of invisible pathways and other shit, then you gotta deal with these giant clams that no, you can't ignore, otherwise they just follow you into the boss room and overwhelm you. All this just for another attempt. Oh look, he went ape shit and killed me like a chump, now I gotta do all that over again. It was exhausting, at a point in the game where I was already feeling burnt out. You should have seen my face when I met the booby lady, not because of her massive cleavage, but when you meet her, you can finally warp between active bonfires. Oh my god, you get this way too late into the game. I was ecstatic to finally cut the backtracking in half, but I was also like, shit, I'm over 30 hours into this game, what the hell? That's my biggest problem with Dark Souls, honestly. For as minimalistic as it yearns to be, it's a little too long to warrant it, I think. You remember back in my Metal Gear Solid 5 Phantom Pain review and how despite the fantastic gameplay, it wore me out with its lack of story and repetitious nature? It's sort of the same for me here, only Dark Souls is also much harder. I mean, I can get past a hard game as long as it's a tough but fair challenge, something I think Dark Souls does perfectly fine, but only for a certain amount of time. Over 50 hours? Yeah, you're getting your money's worth, no doubt, but I was exhausted by the end of it. I made plenty of memories, to be fair. I beat this Jeremiah guy and took his silly ass Q-tip outfit with me. I caused a bunch of bounty hunters to chase me around and jump off cliffs for some soul grinding. I had way too much fun with this game's ragdoll physics. Just, just like rub them against the walls and just fucking mess around with them. <laughs> like dance my little puppets. You all look like you're breakdancing. You'll definitely have hair on your balls when you finish this one up, and this game is exploding with secrets that I'm sure I didn't even cover and alternate ways of playing it. Maybe if I ever decide to live stream this game, I'll go for a magic build next time, who knows? There was a lot of weapons, armors, cloaks, shields, a lot of items I ended up not using because you know they're suited for playstyles that I wasn't comfortable with, but you know, that's how much is given to you in this game to approach the game how you want. Don't expect to beat this in a weekend. This is an investment, a long-term, tough as nails investment, but if you want a good challenge, yeah, I'd say go for it but none of that compares to what I consider the greatest challenge in making this video. I'm not talking about the undead dragon inside the painting world or the battle with the four kings. I'm not even talking about Gwyn, Lord of Cinder. Child's play when compared to the horrors of raising a newborn kitten. Folks, meet Celine. She was abandoned by her mother about four weeks ago and I took her in. She's the main reason why this video took a bit to come out. I've been spending the time nursing her back to health and playing Dark Souls at the same time. That's a healthy combination, but I think I'm doing good. She's way more active and fidgety. She's, she can see now. She's moving all over the place. I, I, I've been a very overprotective and paranoid father to this kitten the last couple of weeks, but uh, it's good to see that she's doing well and I'm um, welcoming her to my family. My family of uh, myself, my area rug my futon in my basement <laughs> but uh uh here's the beginning of a beautiful friendship celine you give me a bro fist 
Okay, you do it later. So right now I wanna personally thank everyone who gave me feedback on the last video and my, uh, my Twitter account uh, regarding uh, how I should handle future Donators Marathon. So uh, from now on, whenever I decide it's time to do another like Donator Showcase, I'll combine a lot of games together because you know, I, I <laughs> this last couple of months have been quite a mess in terms of video production. Uh, I mean, the live streams have been a great way to fill in the time and I want to, I really want to thank my Twitch audience for just sticking by and, and have, supplying me with laughs and all that sort of shit. It's been, it's been a great way to fill the gap, but you know, I really want to get back to making versus videos. So now that the Donators Marathon is over, I got my next marathon planned and ready to go. Before then though, I want to do a couple of individual videos before we get started. The beginning of summer is looking great with what I got in store and I hope you guys look forward to it as well with all that said i'm exhausted i nothing to do with dark souls ever again until maybe the sequels or live stream who knows thank you all for watching have yourselves a fantastic night and take care i decided to look around for something else to worship something i could really count on and immediately i thought of the sun happened like that overnight i became a sun worshiper well not overnight you can't see the sun at night <laughs> First thing the next morning. <laughs>